So my name is Jacob Shockey. Um, I drove up from Southern Oregon. I uh, live down there. Um, it's been fun listening to the presentations on livestock. I grew up on 40 acres and had a big herd of dairy goats, and we only ever lost them to uh, feral dogs. That was that was the big thing. Um, so. Uh, I've got a business, Beaver State Wildlife Solutions. Um, as a wildlife biologist, I spend a lot of time kind of working on that urban interface where wildlife come into conflict with people. Um, and recently I've been working a lot with beaver. Um, we are the beaver state and there are a lot of beaver in this state. Um, and they cause all sorts of problems. Um, my background I went to school up in Washington State and uh, spent a while with pygmy sloths down in Panama and sperm whales out on the Pacific. Um, so kind of cut my teeth out away from here, got back to Oregon um, where I grew up and pretty quickly became involved in watershed restoration work um, and beaver and so I've been doing that for about the last six or seven years. And the, the critical thing to understanding beaver is first to kind of walk through um, their natural history, if you will. And, and beaver seem to bl blindsight people a lot, you know. Um, and one of the best things I can do for you in trying to mitigate potential problems with beaver is kind of give you an overview first of, of what they do on a landscape. Um, so they're a, they're a big rodent. Um, They've got a couple different structures that they build. Uh, the first is the lodge. So this is actually where they live. Sometimes you'll see the classic you know, pyramid shape. This is in a wetland in the Illinois Valley. Um, so it's actually to get the beaver up out of the profile of the, the water. Um, this one, they've actually mounted sticks over a lodge that was built into the, uh, the bank itself that was out in the sawtooths. And that's to keep predators from burrowing down through the uh, dirt to get to them. Um, so that's a very typical beaver structure sometimes. Uh, a lot of times in Oregon, you won't see that at all. They'll just be in the, in the bank itself. Um, they always have underground or underwater entrances. Um, that's a really key thing to understand. And that, that underwater entrance is, is a big deal for the beaver. That's, that's what keeps their kits protected. Um, so they'll go through the water and then up into a dry space. This is one I crawled up into. Um, and you can see it's all scooped out. They've got a nice little bed of canary grass. It's a cozy dry spot and that's where they'll have their kits. Um, beaver structure, uh, family structure, you've got the mom and the dad. Uh, you've also got, it's kind of like wolves, the teenagers that help take care of the young kits for a year or two um, before going out and dispersing. So usually you've got you know, anywhere between five and seven, eight individuals in a family colony. Uh, so then this, this is different than their dam. And a lot of people think, oh, the beavers live in the dam. The dam is a structure to basically impound water. And you'll get damming a lot on the smaller tributaries. Um, beaver that live in big main stem rivers don't have a need to dam because they've got big deep water all around them. Um, but if you're on a smaller tributary, uh, as a beaver, you want to back up water so that you're safe from predation. You know, that, that impounded water keeps you, gives you a buffer from cougars. And cougars, coyotes, those are big uh, predators for beaver. Um, so that's kind of key to thinking about, you know, if a dam is flooding a roadway or causing you an issue, um, to realize the beaver's probably doing that to back up water. Um, they have usually a main dam that's backing up water over that underwater entrance, and then they have auxiliary dams that they're a little less committed to, but will stretch out kind of in their home range. And those are to keep deep water going wherever they might need to go to forage. Um, other signs of beaver, you know, here's the classic um, cut down little sapling that was actually in Germany. Beaver are just starting to come back into some of those areas. Um, and then you've also got the trails. Uh, if it's a really useful trail for them, um, sometimes, and you can see that here, they'll actually start excavating it out and you'll get beaver canals, which are pretty cool. Um, and that also helps them drag material back and forth. Um, and then this is a pretty typical thing you'll see too. So they, they uh, you know, there's a persistent rumor beaver eat fish. They don't. They're uh, completely vegetarian. 
primarily they eat the cambium layer, which is that, that living tissue layer on um, trees. And uh, their diet fluctuates throughout the year. So this time of year, when we don't have a lot of other things going on, they're eating a lot of trees and shrubs. Um, during the summer, they'll eat a lot of aquatic plants. People don't realize they have beaver usually in the summer and uh, early fall because the beaver are just eating stuff people don't care about or, or pay attention to. And then as the winter comes and you know, everything goes dormant, that's when you'll start seeing the cutting activity. Um, so then conflicts with beaver, there's a few places that they cause a lot of issues. Uh, one of them is culverts. Uh, this picture, the beaver had plugged up the culvert, starting to come up over the road. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue because you've basically, when a, when a beaver looks at a, a road, right, it's a perfectly good dam with one hole in it. <laughs> and you plug that hole and you get a lot of water backed up really, really quickly. Um, so across the state, you know, ODOT, um, county works, city works, uh, spend a lot of time with excavators trying to scoop out beaver dams um, from culverts. Also, ag land. I took this last week up in the Tualatin area. This is a fescue farmer who was losing um, some serious acreage to beaver flooding to do a backed up culvert on a farm access road. Um, and there's some pretty easy fixes for, for that. Um, so flow devices is kind of a category of a couple different things you can put in to mitigate for beaver flooding. Um, and there's, there's sort of three devices uh, that seem to work really well. Um, the flexible pond leveler, the pipe and fence, and the trapezoidal fence, and we'll kind of get into each one of them. So flexible pond leveler, uh, basically this is, this is like the uh, drain on your bathtub. The level can only go to a certain amount and then it leaks out, right? So we're doing this on a beaver pond. This one here I'm floating out. Uh, this woman had a pond next to her house. She loved the beaver. She loved the ducks that the pond brought in. But the beaver kept incrementally increasing the size of the dam. So more and more water was backing up to the point where she then got a flooded basement. Um, so with this, it's basically a cage on the end of a tube that then you put through the dam here. Here's a picture of me um, putting, putting the outlet through the dam. And you drop that cage down, so that's your intake in the beaver pond. And then whatever level you set the outtake at is the level that that pond will remain at, right? So if you want it up high, you can put it up high in the dam. You can move it you know, if your needs change. Um, and it, it basically secrets water away from the center of the pond where the beaver aren't going to look for a leak moves it through the pipe and out the back end of the dam. So you'll get the beaver coming up to the dam the next morning. They're trying to figure out why the water disappeared, you know? And it's probably psychological torture for beaver because <laughs> they spend all this time looking and looking. And, and uh, they have a really high success rate. Uh, my mentor in Massachusetts has put hundreds and hundreds of these across the landscape. And he has something like a 97% failure rate over seven years. Um, so really effective. The cage is basically to keep the beaver from swimming close enough to the pipe to feel that the water's leaving. So you try to keep it two and a half, three feet in radius away from the intake. And uh, that's such that it excludes the beaver from that area of the pond. They never feel the water leaking. When these have failed, it's because the beaver detects that's the, uh, that's the leak and you'll literally get tons of material mounted over that quickly. Um, Here's a little bit of a diagram too. So basically your cage, you know, um, at the level that you set that pipe is the level that the water is gonna come out at. So trapezoidal fence, this is another option. This is really useful for culverts. Um, what you're doing here is you, you, the, the beaver are, are cueing off the sound of rushing water. That's sort of the, the impetus for damming often. They've done experiments where they put a little battery operated boom box out and it's got like a white noise water sound and they come back and the whole thing's covered in mud. You know, <laughs> they don't like that noise. Um, so with the culvert, you know, they'll start, I don't know if this thing has a little laser, yeah. They'll start damming here and here where they're getting that, uh, that cue, right? Water's rushing out here. And then as they dam on this fence, the further and further they get away, the further that cue diminishes and eventually they usually stop damming. 
because they feel like they've sort of solved the problem. You know, they've, they've dammed to the extent that they're not getting that rushing sound anymore. And it really just tricks them into thinking that you know, they've taken care of something that's bugging them. Um, these are cool because whatever level you've got the water set at, that's the water level that it stays at, right? You're not influencing the water behind the culvert at all. This is just a passive device. Um, and uh, if you do have to change the water level, that's kind of when this next um, device comes in. So this is, if you imagine the first one, right, the flexible pond leveler with the intake cage in the tube, and then you imagine the culvert fence. This is both combined. So you've got a tube going in to a fence around a culvert. And this allows you, you basically, you build this pretty small. You're expecting beaver to dam around that. And then you're setting your pipe through that to then influence the water level. Um, so this can be really useful in protecting spillways or various things where you, where you don't want that level as high as it is right now. Why do the beavers want the level higher once they're safe from predators and things? Why do they just keep wanting to increase it, increase it throughout? That's a good question. Yeah, um, often beaver dams will stabilize at a certain point, um, so you don't get like epic dams, right. you know, over the course of an eight-year beaver lifespan or whatever. Um, but for some reason, some beaver do seem to, you know, it's incremental, a couple inches here and there as they're maintaining the dam. Mm -hmm. It'll get higher and higher. And, and they're backing up water further into that upstream habitat too, so that could be part of it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, expanding that, that range. Because oh. you'll either get them trying to build a really massive dam so that they're pushing water way back, right. or you'll get the auxiliary dams behind that um, oh. going. Yep. Uh, cutting trees another big issue. So this is actually what most beaver are lethally controlled for, uh, especially along riverfront properties, right? We've, we've all got like beautiful ornamental trees or apple trees that are cared a lot about. Um, and, and beaver are really quick and efficient at taking those down. Uh, this picture here um, on, the, on your left, it's uh, kind of showing that a lot of the, the species of our native riparian plants have actually co-evolved with beaver and you know here we have a, a cottonwood that just coppices at that point where it was cut and it's it's coming back um, but you know apple trees don't uh, so that's that's definitely something I, I see a lot of these are these are cool these are two pictures of people trying to do uh, tree protection um, this one here, you can see how the beaver just chewed out the sections of the uh, field fence that it could reach in. And uh, this one here, they had fencing wrapped around the tree. And uh, the beaver, you know, wasn't able to fell it, but definitely managed to kill it. Um, so there's, there's multiple options for protecting trees. You can, you can fence them. I've seen every version of fencing. Just talking with John about doing perf pipe. That's actually pretty effective on, uh, on saplings, especially. Um, I've seen stovepipe, which I can't imagine that's very cheap. Um, what I have done a lot of uh, is this, these are actually two trees that were painted that it wasn't me, but uh, you mix uh, a mixture of latex sand and paint, probably like a quarter sand to three quarters paint, and you can paint that up to about three and a half feet, um, and it's highly effective at keeping beaver from cutting a tree. Um, so. These folks, you know, probably went to their Miller Paint store and just got whatever color, you know, as a reject and cheap. Um, this next one, they really were careful and matched the color exactly, right? <laughs> this, this tree here with the flagging is actually a tree that they've painted. So they came in with black, you know, and highlighted it. You can get really artsy about it. Um, <laughs> And this has been really effective. Um, the beaver bite into that, it starts to grind their teeth, and that is not a tree they want to deal with. Um, so especially in protecting like a couple legacy trees or something you really care about, this, this one's great. You're also not going to worry about girdling the fencing often. You get to the point where you forgot you did that eight years ago, and it'll girdle a tree. Um, there's actually one picture out there of a beaver who built a uh, a, or it's not of the beaver, a, a situation where there was a dam built at the base of a, uh, of a fenced tree such that it had a ramp and then they cut it off at the top. 
which was pretty cool. Um, but this basically is like, this is a no good tree, I'm not gonna deal with it anymore. Um, one thing that I've done, if people have orchards, you know, a lot of small trees that need protected right on the water, um, electrical fencing, again, is really effective because you've got something that's really connected with the ground, just came out of water, so it's dripping wet, and if you have a couple bare lines um, right at its level, it's pretty, pretty effective at keeping beaver out of a large area, you know, if you've got a crop. Um, so then a little bit just to touch on beaver in the landscape, you know, uh, I grew up out in the Applegate and uh, I was reading the Trapper Journal for the guy who first came through my area. He was a beaver trapper. Um, and he described my, my area as a necklace of beaver ponds. There was no free flowing creek like we, you know, see now. It was, it was one sequential beaver pond after another. And that did a lot for the ecosystem, you know. You had a lot of groundwater recharge because you've slowed down water. Um, you had a lot less erosion. You had these sort of wide wetlands. Um, and the fish habitat is excellent. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, watershed restoration work and I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to emulate this. Um, this is a beaver, pond, or a beaver dam that got built actually on the creek I grew up on. Um, and this, was, this took place over a week. And uh, you know, the fish habitat that's created there, the fact that it's slowing down water, we're a drought prone area. Um, and then you've got an obsessive rodent that's basically gonna try to keep water in your creek all summer long, because their survival depends on it. You know, so I've noticed a lot of places where you've got beaver dams, that's where the creek is gonna be wet year round, and then you get the dry patches in between. Um, so, it's, it's really, uh, you know, they're called a keystone species for a reason. Uh, the habitat that beavers create really impacts um, the larger landscape. And so it's really uh, a good animal to try to work with. You know, if you can leave beaver on the landscape, there's a lot of cascading benefits. Um, I think this is my last slide. Yep. So they're a, uh, they're a rodent. You know, people feel like they don't know what beaver are going to do next. They get really scared. You know, beaver can, can build things and that makes us uncomfortable. Um, but we can outsmart them. There's, there's some pretty simple techniques and, uh, you know, it, I think it's worth it. Yeah. Questions for Jacob? Yeah. Who was your Massachusetts? Is that Lyle? No, it was uh, Mike Callahan. Yep, and he's recently started a nonprofit called uh, the Beaver Institute. Um, so he's looking to kind of subsidize some of these flow devices for private landowners. Um, yeah. And hasn't Maine, or I think Lyle might be in Maine, but as I recall, some of the eastern New England states maybe have done quite a bit of flow devices with the agencies and had some success with it? Yeah, yeah, I think Callahan's installed hundreds and hundreds, and mostly for road departments. Um, they're expensive to put in at first, you know, sometimes the length of pipe is close to $400. Um, but there's a couple of really good papers out showing the cost benefit over the long term. Uh, there was one that was just out of Canada and they're saving tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road, especially if you have an incident, you know, so something washes out and you have to have flagging crews and stuff, that, that cost is just pretty incredible. Um, so these are, these are great because they're kind of an initial investment of a couple grand, um, but then you're good you know, for a decade or more. Um, a lot of what I do is, uh, you know, so I'll put one of these in and then if the folks aren't really interested in maintaining it themselves, I, I'll do a maintenance contract and I go through and check them more or less quarterly to make sure that they're working. Um, but they're, they're really pretty low maintenance. Uh, and, the East Coast, you have acid rain, and so eventually these will dissolve, the metal dissolves, uh, which is freaky as someone from the West Coast because it just seems I mean, scary. You just see the oh yeah, it just disappears. Um, after about five years, seven years, something like that, you know, these are big galvanized panels, like stock panels. Wow. Um, yeah, so we don't have that here. good in the water either, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know the chemistry there. Um, here we have, we have salmon to worry about, you know, we've got fish passage. Um, so there's some cool things here that I didn't show 
for facilitating adult movement through these devices. Um, you can do some cool things with one-way doors. Um, and, uh, and then it's still kind of an ongoing conversation over juvenile passage around beaver dams. I mean, historically, state wildlife felt like beaver dams uh, negatively impacted fish passage. And for a while, they were going through blowing up dams and taking out dams um, to kind of facilitate better fish habitat. Um, which is funny because, you know, they co-evolved and we've all heard the stories of so thick you could walk on their backs or we fished with pitchforks and those were the, those were the runs that had beaver dams as a necklace of, you know, up through the tributaries. Um, so yeah, we don't have the acid rain here. I don't know how long one of these will last, but probably that decade realm. Do beaver and muskrat, will they live together in a, in a similar area? Or totally. And you'll get muskrat kind of using old beaver dens. Okay. Um, there's a cool book, uh, it's called Three Against the Wilderness, and it was a guy um, and his family up in Canada in the 1800s, and he was a fur trapper, and um, he actually brought beaver in. At first he started building fake beaver dams to try to emulate the wetland habitat, because he wanted more fur bearers in his area, right? It's a fur trapper, and he realized that beaver wetlands were so much more productive as far as fur bearers that he needed to start pretending, you know, to be a beaver and getting some dams in there. Eventually, the, uh, the government up in Canada gave him a couple beaver, and he got them going out in there, and he was, um, he was trapping more and more fur just because of all the, you know, the cascading effects, and, you know, he was muskrats and coyotes and such. Um, because you're basically encouraging an, an ecosystem. Huh. Yeah. Is there any interest from ODOT? Or? So uh, I've talked with a few folks at ODOT. Um, recently, there's been uh, a lawsuit against APHIS Wildlife Services um, claiming that uh, trapping beaver is negatively impacting endangered species habitat, right? Because coho are pretty reliant on, on beaver wetlands. So if we have government subsidized trapping coming in and taking out beaver, the dams collapse, becomes incised creek again, you've lost endangered species habitat. That could be seen as a take against an endangered species. Um, so at this point, Wildlife Services is no longer controlling beaver in our state. Um, which is pretty cool because it's kind of forcing some people to think of, you know, some more alternative management. When you've got government subsidized trapping that comes in and takes care of it for free or very little, um, it's hard to incentivize something else. But uh, yeah, so we'll see where that goes. It's it's a temporary pause. Um, but they can yeah. still hire private trappers. Absolutely, and that that's the crux of the issue as far as, you know, from a, from a um, conservation standpoint trying to encourage salmon habitat it's pretty frustrating because beaver are classified in the state as a predator um, even though they're a vegetarian because um, all rodents are classified as a predator in the state of Oregon and as a predator you can shoot as many trap as many as you want with no reporting requirements right it's the same as coyotes or raccoons or anything else um, on federal land they're a fur bearer um, so you do need a fur taker's license, a trapping license, uh -huh. um, and there's a little bit more reporting requirements. There's still no limit. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to go out and, and kill a beaver still. Crazy. Yeah, and, and on the East Coast, that's been something that's really helped is that it's much harder to get permission to lethally trap a beaver, so it's kind of forced looking at some alternative solutions. Yeah, yeah. First off, that was fun. I love beavers. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites. But uh, do you know, or do they keep track of the population of beaver in Oregon? Or state by state, are they actually tracking that? Or Nope. Yeah, so. Nope. It's all guesswork. No, no one knows. There's some cool efforts underway to track, um, kind of coming out of the uh, efforts around salmon to track intrinsic potential across the landscape. Um, to track intrinsic potential for beaver. So you run kind of a GIS exercise where you're putting it through multiple filters like, you know, gradient, vegetation cover, blah, 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 and you kind of come up with this map of how many beaver do we think could be out here. Um, but 
yeah, there's, there's absolutely no, no tracking of the numbers. One of the things that I see in my area, which is interesting, um, is you don't get many, like this dam, you know, is pretty unusual. You don't get many beaver up onto the tributaries damming. Um, we've got lots of beaver on the main stem river, but what I think is going on, um, they get killed and trapped off at a high enough rate on the main stem. They never hit carrying capacity, so those young teenage dispersers are never forced into this kind of suboptimal habitat where you've got to build a dam, you know, to create a safe spot to live. Um, unfortunately, when they're living on the river, they don't have the same sort of ecological services that a lot of us are after seeing. You know, they're not sequestering water in the basin, um, and they're not creating that in juvenile fish habitat that we're all after. So even though there's not that many beaver being killed on the main stem, it's still a high enough rate such that we don't get this. And you have to think that, that probably there's less than there has been historically, right? I mean, you, would that be the assumption anecdotally? Yeah, well, from reading those journals, you know, where they talk about creeks were one beaver pond after another, after another, after another. We don't have that anymore. Yeah. We've got the classic, you know, flowing, meandering stream or straightened stream as it might be. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's, that's the thing a lot of, there, there's a lot of speculation on, well, how many beaver could be here? Is this a healthy population? It's like wolves, we don't really know, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Is there evidence that nutria are displacing beaver or out-competing beaver? You know, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, beaver, uh, nutria won't eat trees. Um, I know a lot of uh, nutria are much more likely to tunnel into a whole area and kind of create that catacomb thing that might lead to a dike failing or something. Um, so there's definitely a lot of issues with nutria that then get blamed on beaver. Um, but I'm not sure if there's like a zero sum competition going on or not. Yeah. Is it the trapezoid device? Uh huh. A, a hawk panel or does that have to go all the way down to the, the bed of the pond? Yeah, and in fact, you need a you need a floor in it too. You do need a floor. Yep, yep. I should have kind of called that out. <laughs> and I've used hog panels. You know, the typical buy them at the Grange Co-op or whatever. Um, actually, more effective have been uh, they're called remesh. They're panels that you know, if you're pouring a concrete floor like this, are kind of the uh, the rebar mesh. Sure. And uh, those you can get in a six by six square, whereas the hog panels usually are six by eight. And a beaver, especially a young teenage beaver, can fit through a six by eight. I was gonna say, that seems kind of wide. That's yeah, like yeah, and the six by six, you're good. Um, uh, Callahan up in, uh, over in Massachusetts has had a couple instances where the, somehow the older beaver have communicated to the young beaver to go through the six by six square and plug a culvert and they've had beaver kits. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's relatively rare. Yeah. So. Any other questions for Jacob? So, we've got about cool.